This video series summarizes the workflow for implementing 3D scanning for the damage assessment of bridges with a focus on the corrosion assessment of steel beams. This training was developed under research project SPR 2310, funded by the Connecticut Department of Transportation. The PIs on the project were Arash Zaghi and Alexandra Hain from the University of Connecticut. Hello everyone and welcome to our third tutorial. Today, we're going to go over how we get the scan data from the LEO to the processing software, which is the Artex Studio 14. And then we're also going to go over the processing workflow. So when you first open Artex Studio, this is the screen that you will get. And this gives the option for scan. That's not something we're going to use with the Leo since it has the onboard processing, but if you're going to use the Artec Eva, you may use this scan button. For opening a project, this is once you've already created a project within Artec Studio, if you wanna go back in and view it or edit it, and import from Leo, this is when you want to connect directly to the Leo and transfer the scans that way. You do not use this button when you're transferring with an SD card. As I copied the scans off with an SD card, I'm gonna open them up from a different menu. You go to File and then Import. And when you import the Leo project here, you'll see there's two options. One is connecting directly to the scanner and the other is just a Leo project. This is where you'll open it to open from an SD card. So if you see, I go into my files, see what all my Artex scans and these .pkg files, those are the files directly from the scanner. So I'm going to select the file that I'm working in, which is my project 20, and open it. This process can take a little time, depending on the speed of your computer. All right, now once your project is loaded, sometimes, depending on the number of scans, the scans will automatically load, and sometimes they will not. For this project, since there's only three, they auto-load. To view them, we just click the I button on either side, to zoom out, you use the center scroll button on your mouse, and then to rotate, you're gonna left click and hold, and then rotate the mouse. Zoom in again, center scroll button, and then if you want to move in and out, you can also right click and pull or push. Now if your scans did not automatically load, you're going to select the first scan and then shift and select the bottom one, right click, and there's an option to load scans. So I'll show you what that process looks like if I unload them. They're kind of grayed out and italicized, so then I'll go over, select all the scans again, right click, and load the scans. Now that all our scans are reloaded, we can view them all again. And before we do any processing, what we want to do is save the Artex Studio project. So save project as, and we want to change the location to be the same place where the software is installed. So that's often going to be the C drive. I'm going to just save in the C drive. We can move this once the project's done to our permanent file save location. This is just for processing. Now that our project's saved, the first thing that we're going to do is get rid of some of the extra geometry. This will reduce the file size and increase processing speed. The one thing we want to make sure to do is keep enough geometry between the scans to make sure that we have overlap. So if we look at each of our scans, we see that we have one side of the girder, then the opposite face of the girder, and our last scan is a little bit of the girder past the stiffeners. All right, so then let's turn back on all our geometry. So when I say extra geometry that we can get rid of for now, we wanna make sure we keep our target bars on both sides, so the one attached to the web and the one underneath the bottom flange. We'll keep the area behind the stiffener for now, even though we're really focused on the girder end and we don't have a complete scan in this upper area, we'll crop that after we do alignment. However, these areas of the pier cap down here, some of the extra diaphragm, 
and, and certainly some of this extra information on the opposite beam we can erase. So to do that, we're going to go into Editor, Eraser, and these are all different eraser tools, so you can really use what you're most comfortable with. I personally like the rectangular selection, and then I just go in, press Control, and then left click and select areas. That will highlight them red and you can keep doing that for all the areas you're interested in, but nothing gets deleted until you actually go ahead and hit this erase button. You can do it frequently to make sure that you don't deselect any information you do want to erase or you can select everything and erase at the end. What you want to just be mindful of is to not erase your target bar. That's very important. So the amount that you erase really is a personal preference and you just want to make sure you get all the big things out of the way so it's not going to cause problems in your scan later. So once you have erased a bit of your extra material that you don't think that you will use for alignment, we can then leave the erase menu. We are going to come back to this once we form our final model. We can go back in and then really crop all the unnecessary information and just keep the focus on this one beam end. So we can close out of that. And once we've cropped really the extra information, this is a good time to make a copy of all of our scans. This essentially retains the original information uh, but if we make an error in our processing and we don't want to start all the way from the beginning, this gives us a way to kind of come back to those key scans. So you're going to select all, right click, and then duplicate the scans. So once you have made copies of your scans, you can go ahead and hide these. We are not going to be using those. That is only for if you make essentially a, a mistake in your processing and you want to go back to an earlier point without having to reload everything, recrop out the areas that you've initially erased. So those are all turned off. And also I just want to touch on a, a helpful hint. If you notice that you're rotating the model and it's not rotating how you'd like, at any point you can double click on an area and define the center of rotation. So it's a double left click, you'll see a little pink point pop up and that becomes your new center of rotation. So now that we have our copies and we've erased our extra information, we are going to go over to tools. And the first thing that we're going to do is our registration. This is really going to help us uh, with filtering those scans within the individual scan files. And then the global registration is going to look at all of the frames in the three scans that are selected and see more of the global alignment. So for rough serial registration, you want to make sure that you have both geometry and texture turned on. This allows us to use some of our cross marks and hatches in addition to just the beam geometry itself. We'll go ahead and apply that. And I'm going to slide up this log window. This is where you can see the processes that you're running. And down here, this is our status bar, so you can see the process that you're running, the rough serial registration. And then that green status bar will move along during the process. Now for all of these processes, including the registration and fusion, it is heavily dependent on the computer. So I suggest using a powerful desktop rather than a laptop when possible. So one of the things that you can see is after running that serial registration, there are now these areas of black that are showing up with the girder and that's on both sides. Uh, you can also see the stiffener isn't quite aligned over there. So when we're turning on our, we'll start with this scan, and you see if we turn that off, we do still have all the detail there. It's just essentially the scan is slightly rotated, so the top of the webs are overlapping. So we're going to go through, run our fine registration and our global registration, see if it takes care of that issue. And if not, then we're going to have to do some manual alignment where we can put these crosshairs on each other and then rerun that process. So now for fine registration, same thing. You want to make sure that geometry and texture is clicked on and we'll hit apply. And now looking 
at that fine registration, we see some of those errors has been fixed. So our alignment's looking a little bit better, um, but we can still see when we're looking at the alignment bar that is still not lining up nicely. So what we need to do is we're gonna run our global registration. This is what relates those individual scans to each other. For global registration, we're gonna keep that as geometry and texture. This key frame ratio can range up until one. Um, point one is the default. If you don't see any issues with your alignment, then you can go ahead and keep it at that point let one level. If you want it to be a little more robust, you could increase that up to about point five or so. All right, and our global registration has completed. So let's go in and look at those target bars. We want to check our alignment in areas that have a lot of features so we can see if things are missing. One of the ways we can do that particularly is our target bar. Toggling between frames I found is very helpful to see if there's any discontinuities. So there's nothing that jumps out as far as missing alignment, and that's what we want to see. We are going to confirm this later when we do our measurements. We just want to double check that the thickness is consistent along the web. That's one of the, the best ways to tell if there is a slight misalignment because that can kind of extend along either the web height or the web length. So we just want to make sure when we're using this for thickness measurements. And as you can see, it's, we kind of have this rough surface finish right now. That's because we haven't done the fusion. So don't worry about that. We have multiple ways that we can look at our model. So right now we're rendering a solid, so it's a little easier to work with. We can see what we're looking at, but we can also render points. This is our point cloud. So when you zoom in, you can really see the density of those points. So that can help make it a little clearer if you have problems with misalignment too. So go back to view. I'll also do the wireframe. Just a bunch of different viewing options so you can really see what works best for you. You can also change the color and show scan color. This shows the differences between the scans. So you can see this is our scan one on this side, the purple color. And then on this side, we really have both our scan two and scan three. Personally, I like working in either render solid or render points and using the texture color. So before we move on to our outlier removal, what we're going to do is handle the error in our scans. Since we're scanning a larger object, not all of our scans are perfect and that is measured in this error department. Here you can sort by the maximum error and in general we want to have an error of less than 0.7 but really if we're under one we're okay. The main thing is we had a bunch of scans that did not register and these are the lower quality scans. So what we want to do is go in and delete these. So you can select all and then just delete. I'm gonna go back to the workspace up here and we're gonna do this for each of our scans. We essentially only want to keep our highest quality data. More data does not mean better, so we wanna remove all of those frames with higher errors so we left with the highest quality. This is also an option if you're getting really high errors. So for example, if you have an error of two on one of your scans, you may wanna go ahead and delete that as well. All right, so we go back to our workspace, we can check our errors, make sure that everything is below that one threshold, and then we can move on to that outlier removal. For outlier removal, this is essentially where you set how fine you want the model to detect um, which pieces of data are noisy. So for example, if we zoom in, you see we have some pieces of scan up here that aren't ideal. What, and what I like to do is, since we're working in a non-uniform structure and we have areas that we cannot capture both sides of, like the top of the deck, there's always gonna be some issues. So personally, I like to go in and trim the model a little bit more at this point. 
So I'm going to hold off on the outlier removal, go back to our editor tool, and go to eraser. So I don't want to get rid of our target bars as of yet, but I am going to get rid of our pedestal. When I said a little bit earlier on, you could kind of choose how much you want to crop and at what stage, you can do more of this cropping earlier on. It's really just if you have overlap in some of the frames that you want to use for alignment, then it can be really helpful to keep this additional information. If not, you can get rid of it right away. Once we do the fusion, I'm going to chop the rest of this end as well. For right now, I just want to make sure that I keep that target bar. Now we can go back to our tools and now we're on the outlier removal step. Now this standard deviation multiplier threshold, our text suggests using either a value of two or three. Two is generally suggested for noisier surfaces and three is suggested for less noisy surfaces. Since our surface is a little noisy, I'm gonna go ahead and change this to two. And the resolution, that should be set to the same value that you're going to choose in your fusion process below. So if we're choosing a resolution of one here, we're gonna to wanna to choose a one when we're doing our resolution for fusion. I'm gonna go ahead and run that process. And you do wanna make sure when you're running this that none of the objects that you wanted to maintain are getting cropped out in this process. So for any reason, if your target bar was suddenly removed, you're gonna to wanna to go back and, and change the parameters and rerun. Outlier removal, it really is an optional step. You can do this by going in with the eraser tool and getting rid of everything you need to do. Um, I often use that. This is more so if there's just perhaps small pieces of scan data that you missed. So this is really best for situations where we have a more homogeneous material that we're scanning. Our target bars weren't removed. I am going to go in and just crop this out now. So I'm going back to my eraser. Erasing is one of those processes that you're going to do multiple times, most likely throughout processing, because as you look at the scan in different directions, you'll find new things. And you can see in the directions over here, if you do control and then your scroll wheel, you can make it bigger or smaller. Press control, that brings my tool back up. I highly suggest trying out all the different erasing tools and finding the ones that you're most comfortable with. Personally, I like using the 2D selection and the rectangular selection most, but I know others that are much more comfortable with something like the lasso. So try them out and see what works best for you. All right, so now that I'm done with this step, I just wanna go back to my main screen, and this is a good time to save again. Once again, in case something crashes, we wanna make sure that we're not missing out on all the steps that we've completed. Now that we've saved it, and you'll actually notice some of our error measurements went down slightly when we were getting rid of those additional frames. And that's because a lot of the areas that we deleted, we weren't focused on during the scanning process. We were really mostly just focused on the beam end. So the areas like the opposite beam or the underside of the deck, those areas are subject to more error. So now for the final step is the fusion process. And you're not going to apply all of these you're really only going to choose one. Fast fusion can be good if you're trying out your settings and you wanna make sure everything's worse. And what I mean for that is the resolution. One is the default. The manual suggests for the RTEC you use 1.5, but this is really setting the, the resolution of your final model, so I like to do it a little bit lower. So I'm gonna move that down to 0.5. I know for the outlier removal, I did say that generally you wanna use the same measurement or the same input for your outlier removal for the resolution and for the fast fusion. However, outlier removal is not a critical step in the process, so you can play with that a little bit. So first, to make sure that the 0.5 resolution is working, I'm gonna go ahead and apply that. For scans in general, for the final model that we're gonna output, we're gonna wanna use the sharp fusion. But we're gonna do fast fusion for now just to see how the resolution setting works. All right, and now we can see our fast fusion model has completed. What we wanna do is really go in here, check that that resolution worked and that everything is looking good. We can see the level of corrosion and that's great. When you do a fusion, it does not automatically apply the texture. That's another step that we have to add later. As I mentioned though, we wanna do the 
sharp fusion. We don't want to do the fast fusion. We just want to make sure that what we chose worked okay. So we're going to come back up, select these three scans again, and then we're going to go through the same process with the sharp fusion. We're going to change our resolution back to that 0.5. And then there is the fill holes. We can do by radius, but what you want to do for this is make sure that you're very aware of the holes that are from corrosion and the holes that you're filling. So what we want to do is only fill the holes that are small that may become from a slightly missing part. We don't want this to get filled in. So in general, I suggest to make this quite small. Um, if you find that you need to fill larger holes, you can go ahead and do that. But I'm gonna set that to just one millimeter for now. So if we have any holes that are two millimeters, which I don't believe we have many of, but you can just do a zoom in and check real quick. These might be a little bit bigger than that. Those might get filled in. This hole is substantially bigger. This hole was actually where the stiffener was cut out. Uh, so there may be a couple spaces in here, but overwhelmingly this whole area of the stiffener is highly corroded, so we're not gonna be missing out on a lot of holes there. Uh, this is, these are the kind of holes that we're looking to fill. You can also select the manual fill option. That gives you a little more control. So once again, this hole radius, that's really gonna be dependent on the specific beam that you're scanning. And we're gonna leave remove targets on off. So I'm gonna go ahead and apply that. And now that our sharp fusion has finished, I'm gonna go ahead and make a copy so we can cut out the additional parts of the diaphragm as well as this back half of the girder. So I'm just gonna select, right click, and then duplicate the scan. Now we can see our copy of the Sharp Fusion. So I'll turn that one off, and then I'm gonna go back into my Erase Zone. And the reason that I'm still leaving all these other files here is that we haven't done our check along the length and the height of the beam to make sure the web thicknesses are similar. So before we export this in our project, we're gonna keep all the scans in case we ever need to go back. And it's helpful to just crop a little bit more before we take our measurements as working on both sides of the beam can be hard. And the reason that I'm keeping the copy of the Sharp Fusion is so I do have one scan that still has the target bar in it. But otherwise, just go around and crop out all those other areas you don't need to make your life easier. And then we should have a relatively flat plane to look at our web thickness. All right, before we start our texturing process to complete the model, we want to ensure that there hasn't been any error buildup. So making sure that both faces of the web, since we scan them at separate times, making sure that they are aligned. So to do that, the easiest way is to use the section cut tool. That allows us to take sections along the length of the beam, and then we can select points on either side of the web that fall on that section line and get our web thickness. What we want to do is compare the thickness at intact points on the web along the length, and we also want to compare this to the known thickness value. So to do that, I just further cropped the model so it would only show the web section. I got rid of the stiffeners and everything. This just makes it a little easier when we're putting a bounding box around. Now before we do the section cuts, we want to position our beam so it's on the center of the axis. So to do that, we go to Editor, go to Positioning, and we want to pick three points to bring it to the correct plane. We'd be doing our ZOX, and my three points would be one on the web, one on the flange, and another one on the flange. Now to rotate, we're going to hold the shift key. We can rotate using these tools up here. This is one of those steps that's just great to know how to do no matter what sort of modeling you're working with. And it can be done at any step in the process. You could do this earlier on, uh, but it 
can be really great when you're taking section cuts. So whether your object is large or small, just having a source of alignment, particularly before you export, is quite nice. All right, so now that this looks fairly good, we're going to hit Apply and then go to our Measures tool. The first thing we're going to do is create sections. To do that, we have to select which model we want to draw the sections on, and we're going to go ahead and hit Next. So we have our XOZ face. We're going to make it parallel. Now to create a section, we're going to have to select our points. So I'm going to select two on the bottom flange, one at mid-height, and then two on the top flange. This is our section that's parallel with that XOZ face. And then if you want to translate the section, you can move it around. So you can either hold the box and slide the whole thing in every direction, or you can select one of the arrows. Once you've positioned the section cut, you want to make sure that it's capturing the outline and that it looks fairly consistent along the height. This makes sense for the front because we didn't capture that tip of the web. So once we have selected that, we want to go ahead and create our section. And then we can copy this section along the length to see how the height varies along different points. So I'm going to do four sections. This is in millimeters, so I'm going to do I'm going to do 150 millimeters, and this is going in the negative y direction, so I'm going to change my direction to negative. And then you can see all of the sections pop up. This one is a little close to the weld, so I think I'm going to just change this from 150 to 165 or 160 maybe. And we can see that that bumped it out that little bit more. We can hit apply and then those measurements are all saved. So when we're selecting our points to measure, we can select along each side and we have these guidelines to make sure we're hitting the right point. So now to take those linear measurements, we're going to select this linear measurements tool. Same, keep that copy of the copy selected. And what we want to do is we want to show all measurements so we can use the outlines as our guiding lines. The reason there are these other lines is it, it expects it to be a watertight 3D model. So what that's doing is it's going all around that bounding box and connecting the lines. So first I'm going to select one point there, rotate it around, and get a measurement. You want to see that your measurements are essentially along the same line, so this is something that you can rotate. The measurements can be a bit tricky. So once you modify it, like I moved that point too because I thought it looked better, but then it actually brought it to a point off that line. So now my point two is on the line. I have my measurement 6.29. Uh, this is where you want to check and compare it to your normal section, which for this beam was 5 eighths. So if we do 5 eighths, we'll see that that's 0.625 inches convert that to millimeters, and we get 15.875. So that's within reason, especially without doing a deep dive into making sure the points are perfectly correct. But what we want to do now is get an idea if this is consistent along the length of the beam. So now we can see we're on our two lines, and we're getting 17.61. So that is a little bit bigger, so that's why we have the four sections to see if that trend continues on. That could be a sign that the alignment is off. So I'm going to go to my next section. 
All right, and that's 18.24. So it does look like we're following that trend where the web is, is gaining some thickness, which suggests that our alignment is off along the length. I'm gonna confirm this with the last point. Um, if the last point was back in the 16s, then the next step would be to really take a look at where those measurements are being taken, move the points so they're perfectly on those lines, uh, but otherwise we have to go back and work with our alignment. Unfortunately, it does look like we have a, a slight difference in alignment and that's giving us a difference of about three millimeters along the length. So we can apply those if we want. We can save those for later on these sections. And then we're gonna have to go back to our main tab. This is why we've made our copies. We can even go back if we'd like to our originals before we did any processing and do some alignment. If your measurements line up, then you are good to go ahead and start your texturing process. However, if they don't and you need to go back and do additional alignment steps, then you need to make sure you do that before texturing. That's because texturing is the most time consuming process. So you don't want to let it run for two hours or so and then end up having to redo all your alignment anyway. So for this, once we have our correct fusion, we can then apply the texture and finalize the model. You wanna to go to the texture tab on the left-hand column, select your fusion and then select all of the original scans that were used in the fusion. What this does is it takes that information and applies it to the fusion. You can then select your output texture size and hit apply. Texturing is one of the most time consuming processes. So just know that it's probably going to take a couple of hours. And if you want it to go faster, you can always reduce that texture resolution. Once it's done, you have some control on the texture. You wanna make sure that you're in texture mode for color, and then you can slide each of the bars so you get the texture that you're looking for. On this example, you can see on the far face, there was a little bit of that, of that white zone where the texture didn't match. And that was due to most likely deleting some of the frames in that region. So if that's something that was an issue, you could always go back, bring in a few of those higher error frames and you shouldn't have that issue. Then just make sure you hit apply and you're all set.